On episode 418 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Dr. Jignesh Shaw and discuss his book, Heart Health, a guide to the tests and treatments you really need. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 418. Have you decided you're ready to make a change? To reclaim your health and fitness? The 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. I'm your host, Alan Meisner. I'm an NSAM certified personal trainer with a specialization in corrective exercise and fitness nutrition. Let me be your coach as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. Our guest today is a board certified cardiologist and a trained epidemiologist. He was trained at Medical Harvard School and has practiced in various countries. With no further ado, Here's Dr. Shah. So, Dr. Shah, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. Now, I really enjoyed reading your book, the book we're going to talk about today, Heart Health, A Guide to the Tests and Treatments You Really Need. Um, Part of the reason is, you know, being in my 50s, this is kind of the time when a lot of the conditions that have us thinking about our heart uh, start popping up, you know, heart attacks uh, and all the other things that can go wrong with your heart. Uh, and strokes and things like that, the, that we're, we're reaching that age where we're seeing it happen to our friends and, and family that were right around this age. And in some cases, people lost their parents around this age. Um, so we start to think about, well, how healthy am I? Uh, and so yes. I, I like this because, you know, you would just think, oh, well, I'll just go in and get these, these tests done every once in a while, and then I'll know, and I'll know I'm good. But that isn't always the case. Absolutely. And that is... One of the key points of the book that uh, just because we get a test done and the test says you're fine doesn't necessarily mean that nothing will go wrong. We have progressed quite a lot in our understanding of our diseases. However, there are things that we can predict and things that we cannot. And even after a normal test, people can have problems. And on the other side, I would say, just because you have an abnormal test doesn't mean that you are looking at impending doom and gloom. You have a lot more control, you have a lot more time, and you've got to use it effectively to gather all the information before reacting to it. Yeah, I, I think that's that's really kind of where the, when you start talking about heart disease and, and particularly when it's happening, in the moment, it, it is really hard to kind of take that step back and, and think about it objectively because everybody just knows when the last beat of your heart is the last beat, maybe. Um, and so people are, tend to want to fix it now versus taking that step back and thinking about it. And, and that's what's really cool about the book is you had stories in there of individuals that were, were going through different things and, and then different protocols were promoted and they, they either did it or they didn't, but, you know, some of them were rushed into, you know, decisions and some, you know, had, had the wherewithal to get the second opinion. So if I go into the doctor and the doctor tells me there's some problems and they want to do a procedure, it could be, you know, uh, putting in a stent or, or do even a bypass, we should get a second opinion, right? And so you started off really well. You said you go into a doctor's office and that is a critical thing to remember. You went walking into the doctor's office. That's a different scenario. And like you rightly pointed out, that would be a good place where you have enough time to get a second opinion. Now, if you were rushed into the emergency room with chest pain and the EKG showed that you have you're having an active heart attack, that is not a time for a second opinion. So that's where the book tries to give you the nuanced version of it. Um, But you're absolutely right. You go to the doctor's office, tell them, you know, I've been having chest pain when I walk or um, when I'm under a lot of stress. And the doctor says, let's go ahead and do a stress test. That may be reasonable. It's a non-invasive test. They're not going to poke inside your body. They're not going to put catheters inside the heart. Very good test to start. However, it will even in this situation, it will be worthwhile to get a second opinion and slow down the train. In some cases, 
you know, I've known 40 year olds who have been running five, seven miles a day, no problems at all. And then they started different exercise and now they're having chest pain. They're rushed to a stress test. Now in that patient, the same stress test may not be necessary. However, somebody who does not exercise that much and starts exercising and starts noticing chest pain with exercise, a stress test may be necessary. So, but in either case, you have enough time to get a second opinion. Yeah. One of the things I think that was was really important as I started going through the book, and, and you you stress this time and time again, is if if a procedure is recommended, you really want you want one or, or two things to happen as a result of that procedure. You, you either want to know that because of this procedure, I'm going to live longer or and or that I'm going to have a better quality of life. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, and thank you for giving me that uh, opportunity to talk about these two very critical things. As a doctor, there are only two things that we can do for you. We can either prolong your life or make the quality of of your life better. So no matter how pretty the pictures are, how fabulous the technology is, as a patient, you really have to know does it meet one of these two end goals, live longer or live better? So if you went into the doctor for a, what I would call a well baby checkup, uh, annual physical or um, a wellness check, meaning thereby you do not have any symptoms, any tests that is being recommended, you really have to ask, Is this going to make me live longer? Because remember, you do not have symptoms. So the patient can, uh, the physician cannot make the quality of your life better. But if he can improve the quantity of your life, meaning that by your longevity, then you do want to undergo that test. But if that test is not going to make that difference, you really have to question no matter how fabulous the technology is, how convincing the Uh, The logic is if we do this, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens. All of that becomes more and more far-fetched. At the bottom of it all, you want to know, will this make me live longer? And if you're having symptoms, of course, will this take away my symptoms? Is it likely to take away my symptoms? And only then you want to undergo that. And, you know, I would say, even with that, you do want to ask the physician, is there a simpler way to accomplish the same thing? And you would be surprised how often a more simpler approach can sometimes accomplish exactly the same thing. We know from studies after studies now that in majority of the cases, medications accomplish exactly the same as bypass surgery with medication, you know. So you always want to ask the physician, is there a simpler way to accomplish the same goal? Right. So, you know, uh, being older, you know, I, I do go in for wellness checks. And if my doctor had recommended to me, hey, you know, you're you're over 50 now, let's, let's do a, um, a stress test. And you know, I, I haven't had any symptoms. I haven't had any problems. I only had one incident where I, I thought I had a problem, but it turned out to be... Um, uh, basically, my sodium got too low, and I went into the emergency room uh, with chest pains, and uh, that was really because I'd had a um, uh, an episode of a, a seizure, and in, during that seizure, I kind of strained my chest, and so to me, it was you know I was feeling really bad because my sodium was low, and, and I, as soon as I went in, and you say the word chest pains, uh, it leads to a whole <laughs> a whole set of protocols. Uh, you're taken straight to the back, uh, you're given a nitroglycerin, they're putting you on a drip, they're they're checking your your heart rate. They're, they've got you on a machine like that, and so it turned out it was just it was dehydration and low sodium uh, combined was was what my mind was. Now, had they told me after that you probably should go do a stress test, I wouldn't have known any different. I would have just said, okay, well, my doctor said I need to do a stress test. So I think it's important to know that you know, do you have symptoms that are that are some of the heart attack symptoms, but if I agree, okay, the doctor says, okay, you should go get a stress test. And I agree. Uh, tell me about what, what does a stress test entail? You know, what is it like? And, and what's it going to tell us in the end? Right. So a stress test is uh, performed to 
increase the activity of uh, the heart so as to increase the oxygen requirement of the heart itself. And under that stressful situation, if the heart muscles, which are now requiring increased oxygenation, do not hold up, then it indicates to us that there are some blockages to the blood flow to the heart itself. And the way to accomplish that is ideally to walk the patient on the treadmill while connected to the EKG machine and look at how the EKG or ECG changes take place. And if there are some changes, then that is concerning. However, if the patient is able to walk 10, 11 minutes and has no chest pain whatsoever, the EKG does not show any abnormality, then we know that their heart is able to work under this stressful situation, which indirectly tells us that there are no blockages. So the ideal stress test is where you are made to walk on the treadmill with EKG connected to you and somebody's observing the EKG or blood pressure and your heart rate. The, sometimes there are additional testing added on to it where you get injected with radioactive dye which is injected when you are at the peak of your exercise. And then you're put under a camera where the emission from the radioactive dye is picked up. And it helps us understand if there are parts of the heart that are not receiving blood supply. Once again, that indirectly tells us that there may be blockages in the heart artery. That's the typical stress test that is performed. And it is performed to figure out if there is a chance that you have blockages in the heart artery. A lot of times, if someone's had an issue in the past or a doctor just feels uncomfortable uh, and you're going to go in for a surgery for something entirely unrelated, they may make your or require want you to do a stress test. Should you try to get a second opinion? Should you try to talk them out of it if you've had no symptoms? Or is this something that maybe you just want to go ahead and do? No, I think... um, American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association is very clear about the fact that in rare high-risk surgery, you need a cardiac clearance and a stress test prior to that. Outside of those rare surgeries, for 90-95% of surgeries, you do not need a stress test to undergo uh, orthopedic surgery or a back surgery uh, or what have you. And so for majority of the cases, you do not need a stress test. And I would strongly urge you to get a second opinion uh, before you undergo that stress test because the chances of that stress test veering you away from what you really require, which is that surgery, it will just point to a different direction. And as you have read in the book, uh, it will lead you down a path that you do not want to go. Uh, and that is why American College of Cardiology is very clear about the fact that majority, I mean, overwhelming majority, 90, 95% of surgeries do not require a stress test prior to undergoing the surgery. Yeah, you had a story in the book where a woman had uh, torn a ligament in her knee yeah. Um, and as a result, she wasn't able to be active like she wanted to be. And obviously, if you're not active, uh, you a trophy. And and so she couldn't she couldn't walk with her friends. So she was missing the social aspects of, uh, and the fitness aspects of it because she failed a stress test. And then they were like, okay, well, you know. And I I think she went on for other procedures. And but she had to wait a year uh, before right. she could come get that surgery. And that's you know that a year of of inactivity. That, that's scary. Yeah. And so that was definitely not going to extend her life or improve the quality of her life. It was really kind of caused the exact opposite. Exactly. I mean, she went for a stress test that was not required. Then she had, she was asked to undergo this cardiac catheterization and she had complications from that. And uh, from that point forward, it just went into this cascade of negative events where she was not able to get surgery that she required for almost a year. And had she not gone through stress test, like it is recommended by the American College of Cardiology, she would have gotten the ligament surgery and went on to be active back again, which would have done more uh, good 
for a heart than all this additional testing did. Yeah. So I, if, if I go through his first stress test and the doctor finds something abnormal and they say, okay, we need to do this next procedure. It's the cardiac catheterization you spoke about. Can you talk uh-huh. about what that is and how they do it and, and, and what we can find out from it? Yes. A cardiac catheterization is an invasive procedure, meaning that by the doctor is going to get inside the body. They will number up the area around the groin where one of the major artery is. Uh, sometimes they can use the major artery in the arm and put. once they get access into the artery, they put a catheter, a small, tiny, long plastic tube that goes into the heart artery and they inject dye into it while taking pictures of the flow of the dye under the camera. And um, by getting several pictures, we understand where the blockages in the heart arteries are. Um, Based on where the blockages are, we can further prescribe the right type of medicine or discuss the possibility of stents or discuss the possibility of bypass surgery, depending on the pattern of the blockages. So it tells us a lot about mm, the blockages in the heart. And, and, and again, that's one of the things I really like about your book is um, after you've had that, you know, that initial uh, test or, you know, then the second follow-up, the catheterization test, uh, your book goes on to say, okay, here are some of the options that you might be presented there's medication. Sometimes there's bypass with medication and it gives you the questions to ask your doctor. So as you're facing these things, I think your book's an awesome resource for someone because it answers a lot of questions very, very easily. And then you can ask your doctor the right questions. You can get your second opinions and you can make sure you're doing the right thing to increase your longevity and quality of life. Absolutely. And thank you for bringing that up. Because on the web, what I notice is that there are a lot of generic questions, which may or may not apply to specific situations. So I wanted to equip my readers with very specific questions for that particular procedure, which is pertinent so that the patient, the physician also recognizes that you are willing to be an active participant in the process. You are willing to be part of the healthcare team and not just a passive recipient. And and let's hope again that your physician is uh, is amenable to you having that and being a part of that team because if, if that physician is not, you, you might need to find a, another physician. Absolutely. I agree with you completely. Now, you, you, you kind of mentioned Dr. Google. You know, people love to go out on Dr. Google and, and, and self-diagnose. Uh, we also love, love, love to wear these, uh, these tools uh, right. to measure everything. You know, so the Apple Watch and some of the other things that are out there, uh, you can know how well you sleep. You can know how many steps you take in a day. You can know your heart rate every single day. Uh, including uh, now, I guess Apple Watch does an EKG for you. Right. Um, if someone has one of these watches on and they start noticing an, an abnormal rhythm or you know something going on, and their watch is kind of, is, is that something they just definitely need to walk into the doctor and start having some conversations? Or is it something that they should just sort of say, okay, I, I get it. I don't have any other symptoms, but the watch is telling me there's something amiss. Right. So there are... Um, there- Few aspects to it, uh, I will mention. Uh, So if you are having symptoms and it correlates with mm, the EKG section or the heart rate section of your wearable device showing abnormality, if those two concur, then there is good reason to go to the doctor and get checked out. Uh, Secondly, there is a condition called atrial fibrillation. Uh, Unfortunately, as we age, a lot of us become familiar with that term, atrial fibrillation. And what we know is that people who have atrial fibrillation have an increased risk of stroke. And so if the Apple Watch is talking about uh, the possibility of atrial fibrillation based on the EKG, then you do need to get checked by a physician Um, maybe get another um, monitoring gadget that they can look at and figure out if it is indeed atrial fibrillation and if so, how does it need to be treated? Uh, Because of the increased risk of stroke, there are things that we can do to 
decrease your risk of stroke. So from that standpoint, it is critical. Uh, however, the other aspect I would also say is that people don't need to make these wearable devices the source of their anxiety. Uh, please know that uh, nature has given you one of the best gadgets to assess how your body is feeling. And that is your own self, your own understanding of your body. If you notice that every day you've been able to walk five miles and for the past two weeks at two miles, you're just getting uh, wiped out. You're huffing and puffing. Well, that is enough reason. That is more of reason to be concerned over and beyond what the Apple Watch tells you. I think we understand some of the technology. We understand some aspects of how the heart functions and how our body functions, but it is all in combination. Just the heart rate by itself doesn't tell you the complete story. Just the EKG by itself doesn't tell you the story. That is where physicians can put things together for you and say, is this critical or is this not critical to uh, be addressed? And sometimes the treatment can be worse than the disease itself. And I want the listeners and the readers of my book to be open to that uh, conversation. That is this something that is so bad that the treatment will make it better? Or is it six of one and half dozen of another? Or yeah. worse, uh, treatment is worse than the disease. Yeah. Now, an, another interesting thing that comes out of these wearables, and it's a conversation I've had with one of my clients, um, he, uh, he has a resting heart rate in the low 50s. Mm-hmm. And I have a resting heart rate in the high 70s. And so, yeah. you know, if we go and we look at that formula where our bodies, you know, and our watches are saying, you know, stay in this zone. Um, yeah. He can't. He can't get to the zone. <laughs> he can go 100. percent His perceived effort level is is 100, percent and his heart rate just will not get up to past 140, uh, 150. Right. It just it just won't. Mine, uh, I can get my heart rate up pretty quickly, uh, but I also don't feel full exertion at 177 or 180. I can actually exert past that uh, mm-hmm. for a sustained period of time. And and I try to you know I try to explain to folks it's like okay, this is a formula. That yes. works for a lot of people, but not everybody. So can you talk about the the where this max heart rate thing came from and, and, and how it kind of blew up into this uh, fitness craze of people thinking that they have to be in this magical zone all the time? Absolutely. Uh, so that is a very interesting story. You know, in the 19, 1930s and 40s, doctors have promoted this idea that any kind of activity is bad for your heart. Uh, patients with heart condition used to be told, you need to rest, you can't uh, exert yourself too much, you can't have too much stress, you can't argue with people, and so on. And then as time went on, uh, in the 50s, they re- started realizing that that people are actually doing better when they're exercising. So the whole uh, promotion of exercise came into being. Uh, jogging was promoted and so on. And at that point in time, burning question in the um, physician community and cardiologist community specifically was for our heart patients who have had surgery um, for the heart condition, what kind of exercise can be recommend safely. So that was a burning question that was brought up time and time again. And uh, the health services department knew that they would be asked this question during a certain meeting. And so at that point in time, what they did was the junior colleague was asked to collect uh, some data regarding that. So he took into consideration 10 papers written about cardiac patients, young heart patients who had undergone heart surgery uh, and what was the safe level of exercise. And when they assessed this data in a very preliminary manner, they said, you know, there is this easy formula that we can come up with, which is 220 minus the age uh, based on what they observe. And so they went and spoke at the conference and when they were as expected, asked, how much exercise can somebody do Uh, after having had heart surgery, after having had heart disease? They said, 
it seems that the safe level is to get to a heart rate of 220 minus age. Now, even the people who were recommending this knew that even among heart patients, people who had undergone heart surgery, this was a wide range. This was just a general guidance given, just like what is an average human height? And we would say in the US, it is five feet, nine inches or five feet, eight inches. That doesn't mean that if I'm five feet, seven, I need to get worked up about it. We innately recognize that. And so the experts assume that this would be recognized, that this is not hard and fast rule. And this was the data only for patients who had had surgery uh, at a young age or had significant heart disease. But um, as it happens, numbers are very attractive, you know. Uh, so it just took a life of its own. Uh, so people put up posters in, uh, in the uh, fitness centers and gymnasiums and so on. And then there was a wearable device made. And sure enough, that industry has just exploded. So the drumbeats of measurement and quantifying has just taken on a life of its own, though this was never meant specifically for, this was never meant for the general population. Uh, so it is good to have a general guidance. However, um, do not let yourself be restricted just because of this. Um, as I mentioned, nature has given us a much better parameter, which is, how do you feel? Are you feeling all right? Then go for it. Exert yourself a little more. If you're not feeling all right, it doesn't matter at what heart rate you are. That's body's way and nature's way of telling you that maybe there is something amiss and you need to stop. Cool. I define wellness as being the healthiest, fittest, and happiest you can be. What are three strategies or tactics to get and stay well? Um, in terms of tactics, number one, I would say is look at home care more than health care to make you healthier. And what I mean by that is regular exercise, quitting smoking, and eating a healthy diet. That would be the first and foremost thing that you can do at home to get the most bang for the buck. Now, step number two would be to get a good assessment and control of your blood pressure and if you're a diabetic, of your blood sugar. That would be my step two. And the step three would be to practice optimism, mindfulness, and gratitude. And I see all these three based on solid research evidence, which has shown that all these three things provide you with much healthier heart, um, much healthier heart than otherwise. There has been tremendous research on optimism, gratitude, and mindfulness. And people who are able to practice this tend to live five to 10 years longer and happier life compared to the pessimists among us. So uh, I would strongly recommend your audience to consider these home care steps before approaching the healthcare system. Yeah, those, those were really cool. Thank you for that. Um, if someone wanted to learn more about you, learn more about the book, Heart Health, A Guide to the Tests and Treatments You Really Need, where would you like for me to send them? So my book is available anywhere books are sold, amazon.com barnesandnobles.com, uh, Books a Million, uh, etc. If you want to learn more about heart and all these tests and treatments, but want to explore it a little more, want to know a little bit more about me or want to communicate with me, I have a website called jshah, J-S-H-A-H, md.com jshahmd.com where i have a lot of information about heart conditions with pictures with videos and even if you 
are being advised a test or procedure you will have videos to refer to you will have some written material that is not difficult to understand and so it would be worth looking into that Okay. This is uh, episode 418. So you can go to 40 plus fitness podcast.com forward slash 418. And I'll be sure to have those links there. So Dr. Shah, thank you so much for being a part of 40 plus fitness. Thank you very much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Before we get out of here, I do have one question I want to ask you. Do you know why you're doing certain things that you're doing for your health? I mean, sure, you've cut out certain foods and maybe you're getting your steps in every day uh, and you're doing a lot of other things, but do you know that you're on path to meet your goals? Do you even have any established goals? Do you have a strategy that's going to help you be effective in your health and fitness journey? Because that's the big key to all of this. You can do any little tactic you want. You can throw all this stuff at the wall to try to see what sticks, but if you want to get results, you've got to have a strategy. So let's book a strategy call. It's completely complimentary. won't cost you anything. You can go to 40 plus fitness podcast.com forward slash strategy. And I'll spend about 15 minutes with you. We'll go through your programming. We'll go through your goals and we'll set a, a strategy. Something we'll basically know, let you know from day to day, everything you do is effective in helping you reach your goals and be the person you want to be. So go to 40 plus fitness podcast.com forward slash strategy and book your strategy session today. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Dr. Josh Axe and discuss his book, The Collinger Diet. Until then, have a happy and healthy week.